Are you tired of dealing with heel pain from chronic plantar fasciitis? Have you tried all the treatments with no long-term relief or it keeps coming back? Well, in today's episode, we're going to discuss proven advanced treatments for chronic plantar fasciitis to finally bring you the long-term relief that you have been looking for and to take care of it for good. And what's surprising, it doesn't always have to involve surgery. So this is part three on how to stop plantar fasciitis. We're going to discuss all the advanced treatments. If you want to uh, review all the previous treatments, please see my episode one and two on how to stop plantar fasciitis in our series of how to stop plantar fasciitis. So please stick around for this latest episode. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Gaffney from Dr. Gaffney Best Foot, here today to share what's helped thousands of my patients over the years. And today we're discussing advanced treatment for chronic plantar fasciitis. It's the third in our uh, episodes for how to stop plantar fasciitis. Um, so um, as always, this is not a doctor-patient relationship. This is not medical advice. It's informational purposes only. So you've tried all the things to stop your plantar fasciitis, orthotics, stretching, physical therapy, cortisone injections, splints, and it's not gotten better long-term. It keeps coming back. Life is just too hard to be dealing with that. So we're just going to discuss what works and you'd be surprised. It doesn't always have to end in surgery. So first, what is chronic plantar fasciitis? So what it is, is it's just heel pain that's persisting from the plantar fasciitis despite consistent conservative treatment over a period of like six months maybe even up to 12 months so six month mark is the mark that insurance company um, puts on um, the the need for conservative treatment before they pay for advanced treatment so they require you to have at least six months of conservative treatment before they pay for all this more expensive advanced treatments Another um, definition is uh, a thickened plantar fascia at the insertion site on ultrasound or MRI or CT. So over time with that chronic injury reparative process, the uh, plantar fascia starts to get really thick and what we call fibrotic right at the insertion site. So it gets like over six millimeters thickness is considered uh, a chronic condition. So that just means it's real fibrotic. There's a little blood flow to the area, so it makes it extremely resistant to treatment. So uh, before you, you delve into advanced treatment, which is more expensive and can be invasive, um, you have to know why conservative treatment has failed. So, and you have to be honest with yourself, did you really stick to the plan? Did you really do the stretches every day? Where your night splint, where your orthotics? Um, did you have the the uh, cortisone injections in a, in a sequence that's helpful. Um, so many times uh, I've seen over, over time, uh, patients don't follow that plan. I know it's hard, so a lot of, it's hard for some people. So if you haven't, I um, typically recommend my patients that they go back and, and do those treatments again, and then we'll revisit looking into advanced treatments at a month to two months after, um, trying that consistently and being, being diligent with it because conservative treatment does work 80 to 90 percent of the time so it's worth it because these advanced treatments are expensive and also um, make sure you're taking care of the root cause and we discussed all that in our previous episodes uh, where you need to check out uh, how to stop plantar fasciitis part one and part two so we go through all the uh, different treatments so please um, check that out um, so you need to take care of the root cause before moving forward. So, um, so advanced treatment options have been shown to stop chronic plantar fasciitis in over 80% of the patients. And, and this is in the scientific literature and we'll discuss, um, two, uh, to three, um, treatment options. And the first one can be rather surprising because it doesn't involve surgery and it can be done in the office which is awesome. So it's called extracorporeal pulse activation technology or EPAT. So this is a form of what's called ESWT, which is extracorporeal shockwave therapy. And this actually was first developed um, as lithotripsy to break up kidney stones. So they developed it into um, technology to 
treat musculoskeletal conditions and it works great for plantar fasciitis. So it's been around since the late 90s. Um, I used the giant EST, ESWT device. Um, when it first came out, we had to use it in the OR and it was a big clunky device that you, the patients need sedation and, and um, anesthesia for. But now you, they've developed these small devices that can be used in doctor's offices and you don't even need anesthesia and you can get it right done, done right in the office, which is awesome. So anyway, how does EPAT work? So it uses sound pressure waves to stimulate healing in chronically injured areas such as chronic plantar fasciitis. The sound waves pulse into the in injured area and they alter pain receptors. So you get a controlled microtrauma. Uh, chronic plantar fasciitis is kind of uncontrolled microtrauma. <laughs> So um, this kind of stimulates the body's healing um, naturally through improved circulation to the plantar fascia insertion site. So essentially, it takes chronic non-responsive injured tissue that plantar fascia is that thick insertion site at the heel bone, has very little blood flow and turns it into a mildly acute injury. And Anytime you have an acute injury, you have an influx of blood flow and growth factors. Your body wants to heal the area. So you get all that into the area and it goes into that tough fibrotic tissue, which is formed from the chronic plantar fasciitis and it causes repair and regeneration. So it's like regenerative medicine. It's awesome. So it basically jumpstarts your body's own healing processes that have become stagnant. So it's really, really awesome. So some key features um, about the EPAT is that it's FDA approved, no anesthesia is required, which is awesome. It's non-invasive, that's biggie. Um, it uses your body's own processes to regenerate injured tissue. Um, it's a once a week treatment that lasts 10 to 15 minutes. And you get three treatment sessions in the office, but you can get up to four to five treatments to um, treat the plantar fasciitis if needed. Um, and some patients' pain relief can be experienced immediately after a session, but most see improvement four weeks after the last treatment with the significant improvement eight to 12 weeks after the last treatment. And full benefits can take up to three months as the new tissue gets regenerated. It takes your body a while to, to uh, fix the problem. Um, treatment sessions can be uncomfortable, but are painless for others. Uh, so in the literature, there's 80% improvement with this technique, which is awesome. Um, so some, the treatments can cause some discomfort, bruising, redness, but generally is well tolerated. So it sounds awesome, doesn't it? Um, some contraindications <clears throat> include patients that are on blood thinners, also patients with low um, circulation, decreased circulation, in their extremities shouldn't have it done. Patients with blood clots in their veins shouldn't have it done. Cancer patients and uh, patients that are pregnant should not have EPAT done. <clears throat> Some post-procedure recommendations include um, continue wearing orthotics, stretching, night splint use. This allows support of the fascia as it heals. Night splint will help it heal in a stretched out position instead of contracted. Uh, continue to do all the physical therapy exercises to strengthen the foot muscles. Supporting the arch was, is important. Strong foot muscles would take stress off your plantar fascia. If done correctly, you can work with your doctor to wean out of your orthotics over time. Um, continue to work on the root cause of the plantar fasciitis, such as overweight or obesity, bad shoes, weak muscles in the foot, inflammatory diet or lifestyle. So health coaches can help with all that, especially, you know, the inflammatory diet and the lifestyle. Um, so this part is really important, often overlooked. So you don't have to have recurrent plantar fasciitis and go through it all again. So uh, identifying and addressing the root cause is highly recommended. So it doesn't happen again. All right. So a big downside to EPAT, this is a bummer, is not covered by insurance. Um, but it, it's not really astronomical, the cost, thankfully. Um, uh, physicians buy the unit and have it in their office. Um, so 
that part's good because you don't have to pay a hospital fee to go in the surgery center to have it done. So the doctors have it in their office. Um, each treatment can cost between $200 to $250. So a minimum of three treatments, most four to five. So the whole series costs $600 to $750. Uh, in my opinion, this is worth it um, with high deductible insurance plans being the mainstay nowadays. This would take a big chunk out of the deductible. Plus, you can use your health savings plan, flexible spending plan to pay for it. And if I personally have chronic plantar fasciitis, I would be doing this treatment. Um, and there's an upside to this downside. Since insurance is not covering it, you don't have to abide by that six-month failed conservative treatment rule. So at any point, if you, uh, if you and your doctor agree to it, you could go ahead and have this procedure done. Um, but uh, again, the standard of care is you should go through consistent conservative treatment before going to this option because it works best in chronic um, plantar fasciitis. So it wouldn't work well when you're just getting started and that ligament's not thickened down there. So another issue with the EPAT, it's difficult to find a doctor who has this device. So you have to search for the doc a doctor that has it. Um, there's a company called Curamedics, and they have a, um, a, a, a tool on there. It's a uh, find a provider service on their website. So you, I'll leave the link on there and you just go and then hit uh, find a provider and they'll hook you up with a doctor that has this device. Um, all right, so we're on to the second advanced treatment, and those are surgeries, unfortunately. And there's uh, two that are done, and it's nice. Both of them can be done through a scope, so it's minimally invasive, which is awesome. Um, when I started uh, my training, everything was open, and that, and when you have open surgery, uh, the um, the recovery time is extended. So. The fact that, that they can do these procedures through scopes nowadays is, is great because it reduces your recovery time greatly. Um, another word about surgery is you shouldn't take it lightly. You really need to discuss it with your foot surgeon thoroughly to um, know what you're getting into. Foot surgery will change your foot, hopefully for the better. Um, recovery from foot surgery is often more involved than other surgeries because there's less blood flow down there. and the foot has to be strong enough and well enough to tolerate weight bearing. So it does take extra time for healing. Um, also, uh, most foot surgeries done with IV sedation, local anesthesia, which also helps to lower risk. Um, but you need to discuss with your primary care um, if you're medically fit to handle surgery. There's, um, it's not to be entered lightly. Anyway, so the first one we'll talk about is the endoscopic plantar fasciitis. So this is similar to arthroscopy where you have minimal incisions as we spoke about and cameras used to visualize the surgery. Um, the, we call it EPF, endoscopic plantar fasciotomy, involves a small one centimeter incision on both sides of the heel, medial and lateral, and a scope is placed in the heel and tube, a tube, a cannula is placed for instruments to pass through and the surgeon will release one third of the medial or inside part of the plantar fascia as it inserts in the heel bone there. It's usually done same day surgery center under, under IV sedation and the foot is numbed up. Um, afterwards, patients are placed non partial weight bearing for about three days after surgery, fully increase the full weight bearing as tolerated, usually within 14 days. Athletic activities can be resumed at 12 weeks. So EPF has been seen in studies to have a very good satisfaction rate, close to 90%. And I will um, put a, a notation of, of my sources here at the end of the video and also in the description. Uh, possible complications include but not limited to nerve entrapment, delayed healing, hematoma, painful scar, recurrence, failure of the procedure, and infection. Um, okay, so number two, medial gastrocnemius recession. Uh, this also can be done through a scope. Uh, it's becoming more popular to do this. Um, so the, this involves releasing part of the tendon and muscle tissue at the back of the leg. 
to achieve lengthening and decrease stress on the heel. Um, and it's done with minimal incisions with the cannula and a camera as well. Um, so your surgeon might consider this procedure if you have what's called gastric anemia sequinus or a limitation of upward motion of ankle dorsiflexion. Um, this um, means the muscle group is tight and pulling on the heel bone. There's two muscles that kind of come together to form your Achilles tendon, the soleus and the gastric nemius. The gastric nemius muscle sits on the outside. So you just kind of lengthen the, the fascia, the aponeurosis, we call it, to the gastric nemius muscle. And that seems to be enough to release the tension on the heel. Um, so you may be wondering, why would a surgery be done on my leg when the bottom of my heel is hurting? It turns out there's a connection between that Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia. Um, and it wraps around the heel, the Achilles tendon, and forms a connection with the plantar fascia around the heel bone. So if your heel symptoms involve pain that kind of radiates up the back of the heel, or if there's a heel spur on the back of the heel, that usually um, indicates chronic Achilles tension or tightening. And your surgeon might want to consider this option. Um, so there has been some studies showing a correlation between this gastric nemius tightness and heel uh, pain severity and plantar fasciitis. But again, this is um, becoming uh, more popular to do. <clears throat> so the key features of the endoscopic medial gastric nemius recession, it's done through the scope as we talked about, usually done at the outpatient surgery center, uh, requires a spinal block for anesthesia with IV sedation. After surgery, you can wait bear us tolerated. Uh, depending on the surgery, you might need a post-operative boot. Comfortable weight bearing is tolerated at one week with return to work on average was three weeks based on a systemic review of gastric nemius recessions um, in 2022 by Foot and Ankle International by Arshad. Um, this systematic review reported excellent outcomes of all studies reviewed when treating chronic plantar fasciitis. So complications of the gastric recession include nerve entrapment, infection, blood collection or hematoma, swelling, delayed wound healing, painful scar, recurrence, failure of the procedure. So in conclusion, there's hope for you who have been suffering with chronic plantar fasciitis. Um, so it might not even require surgery. Continue to work with your doctor for the best solution for you. Remember that the root cause of plantar fasciitis must be addressed so you don't have to go through this ordeal again. So I hope all this has helped you. And um, please like and subscribe my channel. I appreciate that very much. That's the best way to support me. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. Hey, thanks so much for watching today. If you learned anything or if I've helped you at all, please like and subscribe to my channel and please leave me comments and I'll answer any questions that you have. Uh, if you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please leave that in the comments as well and I'll do an episode on that in the future. And thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Everybody, it's my disclaimer. Uh, this video is not intended to diagnose treat, prevent any disease, disorder, or condition. It's for informational purposes only. This video does not constitute a doctor-patient relationship. One should always consult their doctor before trying any treatment or concerning any condition. Uh, it is for informational purposes, not, does not constitute medical advice, nor is intended to replace medical advice. Video, video does not constitute doctor-patient relationship. We disclaim liability for incidental or consequential damages and assume no responsibility for liability for any loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of the information provided. The information is provided as is without representations or warranties expressed or implied. One should always consult their doctor before starting any treatment concerning any condition. This information contents of this site is provided as is. No, nothing contained in this site is intended to be instructional for medical diagnosis or treatment. The information should not be considered complete or up to date, nor should it be relied upon to suggest a course of treatment for a particular individual. It should not be used in place of the visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your podiatrist, physician, or other qualified healthcare provider.